Good afternoon, our esteemed panelists. Um, my name is Leah Kabuto, and our group decided to do our proposal on a systematic analysis of gender identity, gender dysphoria, and neural gender conformity in trans adults. And our research question was, what is the relationship between sexual dimorphism and connectomes and gender dysphoria in trans individuals? All right, thank you, Leah. I would like to start with the background information about our topic. First of all, um, the differentiation between sex and gender. Sex um, refers to the physical and biological differences um, of an individual um, being assigned uh, one at birth and with help of the uh, physiological characteristics like um, genitalia or chromosome composition. Uh, someone's sex is generally distinguished into male and female. On the other hand, uh, gender is being described as the social construction of behaviors and attributes based on labels of masculinity and femininity. Um, gender specifically um, describes uh, how person identifies itself. So it covers a wide range of um, a spectrum and they can lay in between the spectrum or even outside, um, which might differ um, to the assigned sex like um, transgender, non-binary or gender neutral. The next bullet point I want to address is uh, the gender identity. Gender identity is one's perception of being male or female. Uh, which is actually already programmed into a fetus's brain uh, through a hormone search during the end of the pregnancy. Therefore, um, a search of um, testosterone um, yeah, gets the brain to develop, develop into a male brain. And without this search of testosterone, um, it's destined to become a female brain. Um, and Additionally, um, studies regarding this topic say actually that um, after baby is born, the environment isn't actually um, changing anything of the uh, sexual orientation or um, the identity. The next point is uh, gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria refers to a person's discontent or distress about the gender assigned and the gender um, identity. And it actually can develop at a pretty early stage in childhood or alternatively um, later on set um, in adolescence or adulthood. The brain structure, um, there's actually um, anatomical differences um, in the total brain volume, or especially with um, cis men and transgender men, similar to the assigned gender um, at birth. And at last, um, the gender identity network, gender, uh, gender identity network describes um, the gender identity as an emergent property in specific networks. Since there's actually a little uh, research on this kind of network, um, the most studies are concentrating on um, the anatomic sexual dysmorphism approach um, and highlighting certain regions of the brain that um, differ from trans um, individual, individuals. All right, thank you. Back to Leia. Thank you, Tim. Um, some factors that influence gender dysphoria are included, but are not limited to genetics um, because genetics influence our physical appearance and physical appearance plays a huge role in how we view ourselves and just, yeah perceive ourselves. Um, and then another factor is hormonal influences during prenatal development, which um, Tim kind of touched on. And then um, environment they are raised in has a, cu a crucial role as well. And then finally, the pronouns used to refer to the individual also plays an important role. Then um, the importance of our study. Um, why are we doing our studies? So, with suicide rates among the GD population being significantly above average, um, conducting further research on gender dysphoria can help shed more light on the condition and can even help lead to the development of more advanced and appropriate support systems and treatment to improve the quality of life of GD individuals. On to our hypothesis section. So gender identity is caused by the sexual dimorphism of certain connectomes, particularly involving the ROIs identified by recent studies, such as the study conducted on gender identity network. And then gender dysphoria is caused by an incongruence of the gender identity network with gender assigned at birth. 
So our hypothesis is that stress levels in people experiencing GD are proportional to how much they conform to a generic gender identity network. The hypotheses that we were working on, there are like three dimensions. First, concerning gender identity, gender dysphoria, and then the stress that's related to gender dysphoria. Now, I'm sure you're all wondering, like, how are we going to assess some of these experiences when they're like so subjective? Like, I mean, how are you going to measure gender dysphoria? So here, what we're going to do is that, first of all, we're going to, um, we're going to ask them to self-report whether or not they experience gender dysphoria. And then we're going to go with the cortisol test. This cortisol test will obviously assess their stress, on, uh, their stress levels. And then we're going to do a functional DTI because we want to uh, approach this problem as a systematic way. We're looking at the big picture of the systems and how the regions of interest interact with each other, specifically the sexual dimorphic regions. So these are the variables that come into play. Um, the most important ones that I need to mention are like the gender affirming care is basically uh, any kind of uh, care that involves like, for example, hormone therapy and gender reassignment surgery, anything to affirm their gender, okay? And then the mirror is something just to make the whole gender dysphoria pronounced is basically to make the gender dysphoria uh, experience be more pronounced. If that makes any sense, I hope that makes sense. Anyway, the dependent variable includes the brain activity and the regions of interest we get from the functional DTI, and then we're going to get the cortisol response from cortisol. Now, the control variables, the age range is specified that way because we want uh, neural maturity to be roughly the same in the participants, and we also hope uh, the sexual orientation to be the same. Androphilic basically means that they're attracted to males, and the reason we specified it this way is because sexual orientation is part of is one of the things that are influenced by sexual dimorphism. So since we want to look at gender identity and sexual dimorphism, it's important for us to keep sexual orientation a control variable, okay? So moving on to the next slide, these are the groups that are involved. The first two groups are the control groups and we are calling them the template group because they will be used to build a, we call it a generic brain template. Basically, the cisgender men and cisgender women we're going to use to make a model of what it looks like for a person to identify the male and identify the female. And then the experimental groups we're going to compare with the templates from the control groups, and these will be trans women. There's no reason why we pick trans women specifically. Uh, we could just go with trans men, but there's no particular reason. We just decided to stick, stick to one gender identity to make it more simple. And the experimental groups will be split into two. One are the, are the ones that have received gender for me care, and the other ones that, uh, those are the ones that have not. Continue. So this is the study design. So there are four steps, but to make it simple, just look at it uh, as halves. The first half is very simple, very straightforward. We're basically just measuring their cortisol levels and doing brain scans, both with and without mirror. Some very simple circumstances. And the reason we're doing this is basically uh, well, as we look at the next step, this is more data heavy. The first, uh, the second half, we start with building two generic templates of the gender identity level. So basically, the male and the female. And, and uh, basically, we're, the next step is we're going to compare the transgender individual, trans women, and compare them with the generic template that we've already made. So. Uh, we're going to be using fractional anisotropy as a basically a quantitative measure of connection strength in the systems. So we kind of had to improvise here actually. We invented, parts, quote unquote, invented something called the conformity score and the non conformity score. Basically, think of it as a way of comparing the, how much they conform to the gender assigned at birth or alternatively, the gender that they identify it. okay? So moving on to the next slide. Okay, these are the results that we expected to find. First of all, we expect the sexually demonic regions of interest uh, to be related to the gender identity network that we are about to isolate. Now, I know some of you might wonder if, um, you might wonder, like, how do we know that this network that, that we isolate is actually the thing that causes us to experience gender, which is a good, 
which is a valid concern because correlation does not equal uh, causation. It's like it's basically like a scientific program, you could say. And yeah, it is true. But I have um, I would say that in this particular case, there is compelling evidence to suggest that it is causation. And I say this because when you think about it, these regions that are involved in the gender identity network, we expect them to be secular in the market, as I mentioned earlier. And if they are to be like that, then that would mean that, well, basically the sexual demographic regions, they are caused by prenatal hormones. So basically hormones that we were exposed to, uh, our brains were exposed to when we were in the womb. So unless, of, uh, unless somehow those hormones impact our brain to sexually demorphize, but at the same time independent and separately causes us to experience gender identity through some mechanism that we don't even know about, it would seem very, you know, it would seem very implausible, I would say. So I would say it's more likely that this network that we I, I managed to isolate, if as long as they're related to sexual demographic regions of interest, will be uh, the causing, the thing that causes us to experience gender identity. Another thing is that uh, as we look at these expected results, these bullet points, um, trans women, we expect them to conform more to the female uh, gender identity um, network template from the, compared to the, uh, that we get from the cisgender woman. And we also expect the conformity score that we calculated early will have correlation with cortisol. Basically, the more that they don't conform to their genderly assigned, uh, sorry, the more that they don't conform to the gender they were assigned at birth, the more stress they feel at. Okay. And we also believe that the ones that have received gender premium care will have will be less stressed, or perhaps they will be uh, they will have normal stress level. And this part we have been observed in other studies. So this is we do really expect that. And as for possible additional findings, uh, we believe that the gender identity network to be uh, related to certain regions, particularly the body ownership network. You might have heard of this from the rubber handing region, it's a pretty famous topic. And this, since then, the body ownership network has been related to a lot of different kinds of disorders, for example, uh, body dysmorphia. And we also expect the gender identity, gender identity network to correlate with specific uh, reasons of brain related to stress. The amygdala and the HPA axis. Uh, and um, we also expect uh, there is a possibility that this gender identity network might somehow directly or indirectly influence our social behavior and self expression. Okay, that is enough for me. Moving on to Tim. All right, thank you, Adam. Um, in terms of limitations, um, first of all, I would like to talk about the sample size is pretty optimistic. Since we need for our research a, a big sample size, uh, we agreed on 260 people composed of six cis men, cis women, trans women, and trans men. A sample size um, resulted for a need for statistical significance uh, in our target tests. Um, secondly, there are some obstacles to different uh, variations of gender brain um, conformability, since it's difficult to measure with the current uh, technologies. In terms of brain connectivity, um, measurements representing brain patterns are um, new to the field of research and therefore hardly um, explored and probably need some time. Due to our restrictive uh, age range between 25 and 30 years old, um, because of a uh, need for a fully developed brain. Um, this might cause an overrepresentation of trans women um, who have experienced gender identity re uh, repression. Um, and that's just because trans individuals um, often try to receive gender affirming care as soon as uh, they are legally able to or um, able to afford it. So trans women have, or have um, been restricted from gender affirming care, um, whether it's due to conservative uh, family backgrounds, um, legally rep uh, repressive governments or social uh, stigmas. 
might have a, a distinct psychological um, changes in the brain and might have distinctly uh, abnormal conversion levels. Um, yeah. And finally, um, false cisgender self-reports could um, prevent uh, in the control groups due to social stigma surrounding the transgender identity, and this could uh, result in an injury bias. All right, thank you. And moving on to Anissa. Okay, so dialogue, so some conversations and discussion points that can arise due to our study being conducted. Um, the question, to what extent do biological and social factors influence gender identity? And there's not been a complete consensus reached on this question because it's a condition that's still being researched. Um, and there's also not yet been a study with a huge representation group like ours. And because we're dealing with the sensitive and controversial issue, um, which is gender dysmorphia, um, especially against the status quo, that's also a conversation that can arise. And confirm confirmation bias due to political and personal stances and trans rights can occur as well. So because we are dealing with an uh, issue that involves political systems, ethical, legal, and social impl implications are important to discuss. So should gender dysmorphia be considered as, an, as a disorder, as it is an integral part of the trans experience, um, we ensure that methods for recruiting participants is ethically sound. And it is also important to just consider that this study might be dangerously misused in pseudosciences by anti-LGBTQ organizations or governments to, quote, treat trans individuals through conversion therapy. And restrictions must be placed for the availability of, quote, gender identity recognizing technology um, and potentially unethical research that was done on gender identity. It's like one, two, three. And finally, these are our references. And yeah, thank you so much for bearing with us and listening. Um, thank you. One word. Wow. <laughs> that was really very, very, very good. Um, I really like that you actually developed your own metric. The idea of developing a scale and how that scale would be able to relate particular psychosocial aspects back to underlying findings from the use of functional diffusion tensor imaging and an anisotropic analysis. That's really cool because that's one of the things, as you may know, that right now in the field, it's, it's just, it's necessary. The, the, the continuity of, of what you did in building your story was excellent. I mean, phenomenally excellent. The handoff, between what one individual would do and then how that felt into the next story, part of the story, stellar. And the actual focus of what you're doing is so socially relevant in terms of at least three factors. Number one, the cutting edge use of neuroscience and technology, inclusive of understanding some of the limitations and how that could then be taken out of context. Number two, a socially potentially contentious, if not provocative issue that the underlying neuroscience may be able to resolve. And then number three, actually both the benefit and the burden or problem of doing that, not only for the individuals themselves, but socially and how that could then be usurped, taken out of various contexts. Truly a 360 degree analysis and address of what you did. And I have to tell you, I mean, I, I from my own experience, there's nothing more frustrating than dealing with technical difficulties. As you guys may know, um, I lecture all over the world, and very often it's just this type of thing with problems bandwidth and connectivity, and it's frustrating. And you guys just kept your cool, didn't miss a, miss a beat, got right back in there. It was like, boom, this is where I start. This is what I do. Grace under pressure is the actual hallmark of the consummate professional, and you guys showed that. Way to lead from the front of the boat. In fact, if you guys were interested, we might be able to take this presentation and develop this into something known as a hypothesis paper in terms of how you might want to be able to use FDTI perhaps together with another form of advanced neuroimaging, which is correlated, correlated molecular neuroimaging to take a look at differential estrogen and testosterone binding, which would be really, really good to sort of just see whether or not the sexually dimorphic nucleus and the basal nucleus of the stria terminalis is in fact that locus 
that is an important biomarker for saying this represents biological transgender or gender dysphoria issues versus not. So if that would be something you'd be interested in, get back in touch with Morgan and say, hey, listen, we'd like to do this. Send me a copy of your slides. And I think we may be able to develop this pretty quickly into hypothesis paper. But overall, bravo, brava, outstanding, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful job. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Giordano. Um, next up, Ms. Loveless, would you like to go ahead? Okay. I second that excellent presentation. You guys handled the technical glitches so well. Um, great slides. I love the design layout and, and typographic uh, uh, choices you guys made. Um, the colors and the fonts made for really clear slides. Um, everything was well organized. Um, your points were clearly and logically presented um, in very concise and digestible manner. It wasn't long drawn out paragraphs of text. Um, you were each engaged and enthusiastic. I am very impressed. Well done, very professionally executed. Perfect, thank you. Um, and Mr. DeFranco, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. This is an outstanding presentation. I'll just echo all the, the panelists so far that have spoken. Um, I mean, the timeliness of it, the, the relevance, um, and the fact that, like Dr. Giordano says, you're tying this very sensitive issue to hard-based science that we can empirically test. The one critique, and I'm not even sure if I would critique it on this specific presentation, but when you, you give a proposal like this and you have um, the expected results slide, there seemed to be a lot of expected results that you guys were looking for. This isn't necessarily bad. It's clearly um, you know, demonstrating that you have foresight and that you're looking for certain things. But sometimes when you have too many expected results, it can result in two things. One, you, you get data and you're only looking to support those conclusions that you had at the beginning of your uh, project. Number two is that this is an incredibly interesting project with a lot of data that could be produced from it. So sometimes you can be a little bit myopic in the way that you look at the data once you're finished with it. And you might miss out on other conclusions that you didn't initially thought of that might be actually more exciting than the initial conclusions that you thought might happen. So that's more of just a, as you guys are emerging scientists, something to think about, about don't you know pigeonhole yourself on certain conclusions that you're looking for you know, have a great question, you know, the methodology, make sure it's sound, and then just see what happens at the end. But it's outstanding presentation. Awesome. Yep. Thank you for your suggestions. And then lastly, uh, Ms. Thompson, over to you. Yeah, I don't know that there's a whole lot I can add. I think this was uh, the strongest presentation we've seen so far this afternoon. Uh, the subject was timely. This is something we read in the news all the time. And I think that's important that you're looking at something that is already in the forefront. It's already in our minds. We see the topic and we go, oh yeah, I just read about that in the news this morning, or I just had this conversation with friends yesterday. This is relevant. I think the one thing I would do is focus on why this is important to all of us as, as a society, as a group that we're talking about a, a subset, a, a small subset of the population. How many people does this affect? What, what percentage of the population does this affect? To put this in context, but then how does that tie into all of us? With suicide rates, how does that impact us as a society? Medical costs, we're all paying for that. Um, lost talent, um, all of that sort of thing. How does this impact everybody? So when you're presenting this, to a larger group, people who might be funding this for you, you're tying this back to why this matters to them. They might not be transgender, they might not know anyone who's transgender, but this, and this is not subject only to this, this team, this is a useful criticism, I think, that across the board. If you can tie this into how this impacts all of us, it makes it that much more relevant. I think the only other thing I would change, just a tweak, is the, the, the focus of your study is to study these uh, the stress levels in these folks, and I didn't see that referred to in your title. So I would pull that up. I would put that in the forefront in the title of your paper. But other than that, I I had almost no notes. There was just there was nothing I could improve upon. 
I, I really did think this was the strongest presentation we've seen so far today. Excellent job. I play devil's advocate. Go for it. I don't, I'm going to sound like the most interesting or the less, least interesting man in the world. I don't ordinarily disagree with Ms. Thompson, but when I do, I disagree. Don't put it in your title because gender dysphoria is in the title. And I think what you do is you subtly engage the idea of the stress component of the dysphoria. And you could put it in the title, I mean, like an examination of biological and psychosocial stress factors, right? You could. Or you could sort of allude back to something that Joe DeFranco said, which is don't overload the expected results. And the other thing is, it's sometimes good to have sort of um, an unanticipated or even um, novel finding or direction. In other words, this could be in some way contributory to, to stress. So although I'm, I'm, I jokingly said I'm disagreeing with Ms. Thompson, what I'm saying is you have options. You can keep your title the way it is and sort of have this kind of like cool Easter egg, like, wow, you're actually gonna look at the, the level of stress in dysphoria and perhaps being able to say, what is dysphoric, which is what, comp, what, what might necessarily be like a full-blown DSM level syndrome, or you could put stress in there as a measurable variable in the title and then you'd be able to sort of address the stress aspect of that directly, up to you. But either one of them, cool. So options are good and they're both win-win options. So I just wanted to add that.